the Sunbrakei, Sinyao Rinpoche, but he's my friend. Watch your words. Maybe something better like a food share, people bring That's their own. Yeah. Somebody yeah. bring some food, yeah. But I think they've got quite a lot of stuff organised already, so if we can just have a little bit I of think work it's around. Control the mind, govern how they think, governmental, and of course the trick they use is propaganda. And I just wonder if there's such a thing as impropaganda. Um, we've had people talk about uh, health in many, many varieties, both personal health, what the pharmaceutical industries are doing, what the nutritional uh, aspects of things doing. Craig gave us a wonderful presentation on GMOs what's going on there to destroy food. The whole world seems to have been turned upside down in this respect. And we now, I think, more than anything else, have a, a sickness industry rather than a healthcare service. I, I, I'm looking at a farmyard. Does anybody else see that? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's becoming surreal almost, isn't it? But uh, the beautiful thing about this is part of the talk I'm, I'm going to hone in on by coming from the outside world to the pub and your personal inside what's going on in there, I may actually be preaching to the converted here, is um, what is the epitome of mental health? If there's one thing that concerns me about the human race at this moment of our history, is that people can be whole, under their own skin, regardless of what's going on out there. If you can be at peace, and serene, and happy, and you know you are a sane individual in an insane world, you've cracked it. You are in an insane world. There's no two ways about it. So when it comes to looking at what is perfect mental health, what is the way to 
um, enhance mental health. If you like to take your own cognitive processes back to have possession of your mind completely out of somebody else's hands or mischief. That's my sole reason for giving a talk like this. I can get passionate about the law, but this really means everything to me. If there's one thing I could let the human race know, is how it works on the inside as a thinking, cognitive, feeling, spiritual entity. Because when you get that bit right, everything falls into place. Everything becomes obvious, and it can, for some people, be quite a shock. Um, I'll be quite honest, there are, there are Buddhist monks who've committed suicide because when they're in the depths of a profound meditation, they watch what is called the dance of Shiva. Everything is creation and destruction all at the same time. It's all on the move. The universe isn't a noun, it's a verb. It never stops doing something and it's one thing doing itself, unless you wish to stand back and see it as anything else. It's the most beautiful clock. It's enormously huge. It works ethically. Everything is perfect, except us. Carl Jung mentioned it. We are the problem. We are our own worst enemy. And the people are divided outside themselves because they are divided within themselves. Unity means bringing something together into one thing. Not having a debate with yourself, not having a war with yourself. Because if you're in that state, you're not whole. And it's one thing to become, to acquire the silent mind, to acquire the mind of uh, the the little children that Jesus Christ spoke of. Lest you become as little children, only then can you enter the kingdom of heaven. What do little children, babies, not have that we've got? Fear. 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 Fear, yes. It's something more fun. You're, everyone's right, but I, I want to go underneath that. Hate. Innocent. They have perfect consciousness. There's right, nothing wrong with them. They have innocence, yes, we can have that. They've got bugger all experience if they're four or five months old. It's words. It's words. They can't be neurotic about anything. They can't reflect on their history. And they can't wander off into the future and see it as good or bad. They are always present. The only reason a small baby will cry is because it's hungry, thirsty, hot, cold, uncomfortable, diseased, uh, or detached, lonely. Sort that out and you suddenly got everything's a miracle because they're always in this moment and they're on full input mode. And our learning curve when we're this small is like this. And as we get older, it just does this. Until people hit the hamster wheel, but they just keep going round and round. Get up, go to work, get home, watch the telly, show the wine, get up, go to work, watch the telly, and on it goes. Um, <clears throat> when you're considering mental health, the one thing to look at is if, if there is a state of good mental health, what is the worst state of mental health? And I'm, gonna, uh, uh, I'm not going to steal anyone's thunder here. This is a guy. Uh, called uh, Thomas Sheridan, who we were very lucky to have here. I think it was you that suggested he came down. It was a brilliant suggestion. <coughs> have a look at that. If you want to write it down, it's an hour long. I suggest you all look at it. It's an absolute work of art. It's a presentation he gave in London this year where he's condensed the entire financial system, governmental system, legal system, religious system by highlighting these people. Psychopaths. So if we're going to talk about mental health, let's talk about what it isn't <laughs> before we go anywhere. <coughs> now then. Psychopaths. Sociopaths. Psychopaths. And I'm going to include a group myself that you might come across at narcissists. a short um, piece from Thomas Sheridan. Uh, it's part of an interview, and this is his view of it. I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm letting him do it because he's better at it than I am. I was trained in counselling many years ago, but I was told you cannot cure psychopaths, sociopaths, or narcissists. So I thought, why study them? You know, if you can't do anything for them, why waste all your energy on that? So I dealt with what I might call the walking wounded, people who suffer a knock in life, something that's blown them out of balance and they're depressed they're all, and they've got stuck in that, or they're anxious and they've got stuck in that, or they feel alone and they've got stuck in that. My job is literally to go into their heads and move them around inside their heads in the sense of this. A comedian gives us an idea to think about and then shows us the funny side and we all laugh. Yes, we have no problem with the fact that that's what a comedian does. Whatever you do, don't go around the other side because there's a group of depressives who are just as talented. Can you get that? That's why what you see depends on where you look at it from, both on the outside and the inside. The glass of water, the old Buddhist chestnut, it is neither half full nor half empty. In Buddhism, there's one word for a very, very long explanation. It's called avidya. And avidya is the ignorance of beings to appreciate that all views are wrong views. Because if those two are possible, then surely there's a whole sphere of ways in where you just feel, well, there's nothing much. A little anxious over here, a little sad, happy over here. Well, it's slightly funny. Depends where you're coming in, doesn't it? So it's not dependent on the thing. It's dependent on your approach to the thing that has you deciding, no, I think it's this. And that's your personal perspective. And people who buy into those, they will suffer. And the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism can be summed up like this. One, all life is suffering. That gets everybody running for the door. Don't want anything to do with that. You know, stop that. No, no, hang on. Two, the causes of suffering. Three, the cessation of suffering. And four, the path to the cessation of suffering. So it is what it is. Why it is what it is. There's a way out how to get there. It's a recipe book of alchemy, and it's why the Chinese drove the, Tibetan, uh, drove the Buddhists out of Tibet. It, 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 historically, all indigenous cultures have subtly and slowly been wiped off the face of the earth. Anyone who holds the pathway to what is beyond what you see in this room is being exterminated. And there's a reason, and it's because the world run by people called psychopaths, and here is Tom Sheridan's view on it, uh, and I, he can put it infinitely better than I can. You might not like what he's got to say here. It's absolutely incredible. It, it almost sounds like a detachment from humanity in a sense. Oh, I don't consider them human. I consider them the, uh, the antithesis of a human being. I, co I consider them a predatory subspecies. I would even go far as calling them either quasi-humanoid or uh, some kind of like hominid. But they're absolutely not human in terms of how they function. Now, I know this kind of language comes with from heavy baggage. It's not like a racist thing. It's not like a bigger thing. They, they appear in every single race. There's no race, religion, uh, or ethnic group or social class that does not have the psychopaths in it and they prey among their own just as much as they prey among anyone else. You can see that in an organization like the Mafia. Again, the Mafia, although it claims to be in a Sicilian organization, La Costa Nostra, they really prey on each other, on their own people. You, you know, even when they went to America and England and where Italians emigrated, yeah. the ordinary Italians were their first victims. So but at the same time, too, they will wrap a cultural framework around it somehow. They're protecting their own kind. And that's how psychopaths are. And you see that a lot. That's, yeah, I don't, I don't consider them human. Even though I'm, I'm a new book, Defeat the Demons, the editor uh, and the publishers actually said, you've really got to put on the back flat psychopaths are not human. Because they, she was so, my editor was so convinced by my arguments then. And uh, they went for it. It's, yeah, like anyone who's been in a relationship with a psychopath will tell you that when it was over and when they got their head together, yeah. they always say to themselves, you know, after they go through the whole thing of what the hell was that? And it lingers in their minds for years and years and years. Yeah. It's when they read books like Puzzling People, The Feed the Demons, or other people's books like Margaret Stout's Sociopath Next Door, that just, it suddenly 
it's almost this revelatory moment, just like noetic sort of uh, insight, that suddenly they go, oh my God, that's exactly what that person was. That's exactly who I was married to. That's exactly how that money and work behaved. And, this, and, and we're, we're dealing with something that people in the past would actually have uh, you know, mythologized or rationalized as demonic, as demonically possessed as werewolves and vampires and so on like that. It really, when you get into it, it's so spooky. I'll give you an example of one of the more spooky aspects of it, is they don't have very good facial recognition. Even for our own families, wives, children, they will have difficulty recognizing them if they're caught unaware. I get numerous st stories from people who've been walking down the street one day and they bump into their husband, but now they realize a psychopath, but at the time they didn't really know that. And then uh, they would catch their own husband, he would turn around and he would scan them up and down for a second or two. This is very commonly reported. And then suddenly his personality would click in that he's using to work his wife and he would suddenly become him. That's what you're dealing with. It's really the most bizarre thing in the world. And that's why you have, like, people who work for politicians would say things like, as soon as they were elected, he became a different human being. And that's literally what happens. Let me just give you some uh, criteria to, so you can understand the mindset of people who really are not a benefit to you. The point of this being, anyone, anyone ever heard of the idea of psychic vampires or um, energy vampires? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me explain the difference between these groups. It's quite subtle, but it's significant. Psychopaths have absolutely no emotions. All their emotions are feigned. They invent characters and personalities, and the reason I took that clip is A, because it condenses it beautifully, but I've watched people do that. They've gone, oh, we had a guy who isn't here anymore, uh, and he wanted to get hold of the Sanctuary Trust and do various things with it, and he was right at my flat. And the one thing about psychopaths is they're actually relatively incompetent. That's why they've got to get other people to do their work for them. They're lazy, and they're not actually very efficient at doing anything. They can't build things. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, no, I know. This is not the way to do it. They're definitely not a psychopath. Um, uh, and so they, they will literally prey on other people to get them to do the work for them, you know, like governments. Uh, you know, go and fight over there for us. Oh, yes, we're brilliant, we've made these decisions. Um, and they'll stall, and he did it in the lounge. He actually, he actually froze, and it was almost like he was dialing up a preset, and then went completely for the sympathy vote, and became a totally different person in front of my eyes. And I thought, I know what's going on here. And I had to bat it away and play it away. Uh, he wanted to bring his girlfriend there, who <laughs> has inclinations that way. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to bed it off now, and you don't have to go. So psychopaths have no emotions. They will fade all of them. What they're missing is intuition. They can't um, sit with folk and uh, hear the melody under the words that says more than the words themselves, if you know what I mean. When somebody talks, they have a say. The truth, more than anything else, is a feeling rather than a literal something. The truth is how it moves. So they have absolutely <coughs> no feelings at all. Therefore, they have no remorse. They don't give a monkey's what they do. And as far as the only, the only morality of work with psychopaths is what I want is okay, what you want isn't. Get in my way and I'll wipe you off the face of the earth. Sociopaths are the same, but they do have feelings. And that is the fundamental difference between the two, because the characteristic behaviours are, are pretty much identical. I'll put up the, the psychopath's behavioural traits and hopefully we'll all become obvious. Where are you? There you go. Uh, one, shall we? So, lack of empathy. They have no feelings for others, none at all. They don't have monkeys to fall out of their actions. Lack of remorse, they have no guilt. They can, they can rationalise it away from the cows come home. This is what Thomas Sheridan calls um, word salad. It's a bit like what Donald Brunstad said, when there are known knowns, known unknowns, unknown knowns and unknown unknowns. And you're sitting there thinking, what? You know, they talk bollocks. Where you and I could sum something up in a small sentence, they will go on for ages and ages and ages. 
superficiality. This is what I was saying earlier. They have no passions for anything. So they don't, they don't create any art, and they never come up with any original thinking. They don't have the equipment to do it with. You all do. Grandiosity. <laughs> they think they're God and perfect and, and have as of right demands. You know, they sort of walk into the room and expect people to move out of the way so they can have a seat because they're them. They're you know, this you know, supreme being that's just arrived. Irresponsibility. They'll blame others um, in a self-perceived perfection. So it's all, the blame is always somebody else. I mean, don't America do that? They turn the whole thing upside down with the Iraqis, the Iranians. And they're, all, they're only getting over there because they're the last countries in the world that have the Rothschild Bank. Uh, that's the only reason they're there. And Venezuela's another one. The guy in Venezuela, though, has got um, the, the local people armed to the teeth. They're ready for an invasion. Everyone on the, like us, everyone on the ground is armed to the teeth, waiting for the Americans. Um, impulsive behavior. What they want now is good, what others want is wrong. This works in the sense that if a psychopath picks up a date and the date doesn't want to have sex, then they're good and uh, they're good and the date is bad. And rape is acceptable because what they want is good. And that's all that's at work. So you'll find your rapists, your serial killers and your murderers there, but you'll also find white collar ones right up at the top. If you can get with the idea that the world's run by white collar criminals and the higher you go the worse it gets, this is why. Never mind whether the banking government, this, uh, what, what, what flag they come under, their human behaviour, their human behaviour in common is this. Uh, compulsive lying, oh, we'll do that to all the, 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 the uh, Blair, Tony Blair, you know, just, just that, that individual is un unbelievable. Yeah. Um, manipulative, they use emotions of others for their agenda, so they'll play on your emotions because they've worked out how to do this. But it is a play act, they are just biological robots who are running around in there, dialing up things to make their situation work. They want what they want out of you. Uh, they're, they're all antisocial behaviour. Now you can always say, that's true of sociopaths, apart from this bit and this bit. So what psychopaths and sociopaths want is your stuff. They want to get you off into a mental health institution, take all your pension fund, your house, your car and everything else, and then they're happy, they're on to the next victim, and off they go again. Narcissists, on the other hand, they want your um, psychic energy. And they'll play a similar sort of game. And there's two types, well there's actually two types of each of these. One is called functional. Functional. My spelling's not out of the window. And the other is dysfunctional. Now let me explain. A functional narcissist will have a cover story. So if you ask them about their stuff, it seems credible. They seem to have something in the background that makes you go, yeah, that seems okay. A dysfunctional narcissist, I've had three in front of me in my life, are at the same time, you have to feel for them terribly. And, and they're hilarious because they will have um, points of grandiosity. It's more the sort of, 
you know, it's, it's thin, it's shallow, there's no one at home. Um, they also have a sense of entitlement, again, like the sociopaths and, uh, uh, and psychopaths. They think they should get what they want because they're special, you know, like this. It's a big badge saying, I'm better than you. So they're very alone. They live in an ivory tower, in the prison with no bars, with only their cryogenic embrace for company. Uh, requires excessive admiration. They would always, only and ever, talk about themselves. Well, I've done, you know, I did this, I did that, I've won this, I've got this. And I, I was at somebody's house about a week ago, there was a woman there doing it, and I sat and smiled and thought, I'm not going to interrupt this, and she spent the entire night in an unpunctuated sentence of telling everybody how fabulous she was. And I was sitting there thinking, she's a bloody narcissist. They don't realise she's a narcissist. And if you disagree with her, that's it, they detonate. You press these like, Um Just, you just talked about that point in terms of narcissists, uh, point number seven. Yes. I would say that's increased now with the advent of social media. Yes. Just putting things on status. Since I so and so forth, I did this, I did that. Especially when it's useless information, you think, why are you putting that you're going to bed for? It's like, it's useless. You know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let me, there are two forms of narcissism, other, 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 below functional and dysfunctional. Um, there's what's called somatic narcissism and intellectual narcissism. Uh, a somatic narcissist, Paris Hilton. What's she famous for? Um, Anyone know what that woman's name is for? <laughs> no. She's got a rich father. That's she, She's eye candy. You know, and that's a somatic narcissist. And again, you've got this sort of veneer passion. She's created no art. She's never come out with any original thoughts. She's just a doll wanting to be adored, craving to be adored. Does anybody remember when Britney Spears shaved her hair off? That's why she did it. I'm not getting enough attention, love me, love me. So they do that. Um, they'll exploit others and they make assumptions about people to perform character assassinations because what narcissists get off on, they, get, they feel good about putting you down. So they'll go, well, of course, you, you don't realise this, that, the other, and so forth, as if they're mind readers. So that they'll actually assume you into existence, put you in a box, and then talk to you as if you exist in that box. And you feel like you've been cornered by this individual. And it's a peculiar feeling. If you know it's happening, you can deal with it. And you have to be very calm. Because if you challenge, don't ever, ever, ever say to a narcissist that they've got no power because they'll detonate in front of you. They want complete control. And if you tell them they have none, that's like taking their ego, ripping it out, setting fire to it and throwing it out the window. There's nothing left. Um, uh, and they envy others, uh, which is why they are, are, are in a lone and self-conceived world. Now, egocentrically, we all do a bit of that. Uh, we all have a sort of labelling of ourselves, you know, I'm this and not that, and I'm one of these, but I'm not one of those. Um, so, hopefully, uh, this will give you some idea of what mental health isn't. So, what's happened to us? Why have we become sort of uh, knackered by the system? Let's have a look at what it's doing. And we're going to go into the human mind. So we've gone from the outside world, all the banking, all the government fraud, all the lies, all the uh, uh, prostitution, fraud, the whole nine yards. And what we have is a mind. We know we have a mind. And most people run like hell because they think, oh, I don't look at that, you know, don't want anything to do with that. I'm going to give you a definition of mind to go forward in the next sort of half an hour with a model. And all I want you to ask yourselves is one question. Do I do that? My definition of mind, it builds what it looks at. What I mean by that is this. <coughs> if you consider it has a focus, it's whatever is underneath it, it will keep building. Let me give you an example. We're in this moment of now, and this moment of now is moving. It's a grace. We can detach from this moment and go back in history and pick something up from the past that is a horror. And we look at it, and the longer we stay there, it colours itself in, and other stuff comes to join in. And yes, it will. It builds itself in. We can do the other. We can pop off into the future and build a terrible tomorrow. It's all fantasy, but the moment you believe you're thinking, all your biology kicks in and it feels as if it's real. So it goes thought, belief, 
feeling real. No, it isn't. It's virtual. The mind is the holodeck, the Star Trek holodeck of your being. You can come up with anything. If I said to you now, close your eyes and think of a house brick in your imagination, everybody could do that. Yeah? No, you go, oh, yeah, you turn it round, you turn it round, maybe not, maybe it's coloured, maybe it's black and white. Depends how good your imagination is. So it's what's underneath there. And what fuels it is consciousness as an energy. In other words, it provides to build. And you only have to think of um, any artist or any, anyone who creates anything. It come, it, they have the idea, the notion on the inside, and then it comes out into this world. They build the chair, they paint the painting, they have the new piece of music. They come out with an original thought that says, you notice that things work like this, and people go, God, you're right. And they bring it into other people's consciousness, such that they So all creativity comes from the inside. Anyone not happy with my definition of mind and why consciousness is an energy? God, that's good. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be very easy. So what can you do? What can this mind do? It can be here now. It can go back in time. And this is already written. It's done with. Unchangeable. The only two things it can do is think of uh, positive things or negative. And it can look at what it looks at in the past in the same way. We can go and remember happy days with people where we went here and did this, and it was absolutely fabulous. And when the kids' days seemed to last for weeks, and it was all wonderful. Or we can go back and pick up the crap. And obviously, with what I've done historically, it's people who've been beaten, people who've been raped, people who've been abused, and they're damaged. Now remember what I said at the start, what you see depends on where you look at it from. So what the depressive has a habit of doing is what I call cyclical rumination. They go back, they pick something up, they bring it back into the now and they play with it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And of course that's called neurosis. They keep thinking about the same thing, but the joke is they keep looking at it the same way. Yes, it's always the same. Yes, it's always the same. They don't get somebody like me to come in and go, no, 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 it's going to look like over here. What's it look like now? The event, historically, is still the same. But the, the phrase I'm looking for when I do counselling is this. Oh, I never thought of looking at it like that before. How many times have you said that or heard other people do that? And what does it mean? It means they change their point of perspective on what it is they're looking at. And that causes psychological healing. You can get rid of the baggage, they can put it to bed, they've dealt with it. It's no longer dragging this huge weight of their history that's weighing them down in every way, and that they're losing facility. Same is true in the future, because the problem is it becomes a habituation, a practice. Where the comedian's really good, like say Paul Murphy, you throw him an idea and he'll find humour in it like that, he'll just bang, 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 and everybody's laughing because he's become good at it. And the depressive is the same. Can you get with that? It's actually the revisiting of the perspective of the object that they're going back in time to look at, not the object itself or the event itself. It's, it's, it's actually saying, can you find some good in that? Can you look at it in such a way that you can unearth some good? And if you practice this, it starts to go faster. And they get good at it. And often what happens if somebody gets this, they'll go home to bed and they'll ring me up the next day, possibly in tears, and go, it's incredible, everything's wonderful, I didn't realise. Because while they're asleep, it keeps going and it develops a mental momentum of its own. What we're looking at here is intellectual flexibility. They're not stuck looking at this thing over and over again, hoovering it up to remind themselves that their life has been an absolute misery. This is not good mental health. This is not good practice. And I'm hoping if you can see that if there is anything in your past that is haunting you perennially, it's coming back to show itself to you because it wants you to find something you haven't yet found in it. Don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. And it's wanting you to do that. 
that and go, oh, that's all I'm supposed to get from that. What an idiot. It's like self-harming, but not in a physical sense. It's... <coughs> but not physical, it's psychological. But they go back and do it. They go back and do it. And they'll go forward and do it. Because we become good at doing it this way, where you can guarantee that there's no point in doing anything. Oh, no, I don't want to start that sort of fall past no point getting started. So they just sit there. Not good. Okay, everyone happy with the fact that mine didn't move around? So, let's have a look at something a little more detailed. <coughs> I did this in the law talk, and I'm going to do it now. At the start of my law talk, I said, I want you to know who you really are, not who you think you are. Now then, we have cognition, the ability to think, we also have intuition. Let's leave that alone for a minute. But I want to tell you something horribly frightening. When you're born, let's have the back of the world's up. When you're born, nine years old, let's have you living to a hundred. So a nice long innings. Over here, when you're born, you have a hundred percent of this and none of this. Hence the innocence, the purity the presentness and the learning curve, <coughs> the learning curve that's almost vertical up here. <coughs> and, and kids already did, didn't we? Kids learn incredibly fast. Because nobody's told them they can't yet. All it needs is one teacher in a classroom to go, oh, you're hopeless, you'll never be any good at maths, you. And if they buy into that, you know, I've met 35, 45 year old people, so no, no, I was told, I've never been any good at maths. I was told the school wouldn't be. And I just think, oh, wait. They actually believe that. And so people have their facility robbed from them throughout their entire life. Now, there is a convention, it's very crude, but it's it's acceptable for the argument. That this is right, this is left brain, this is very crude, it doesn't actually work like this, it's good enough for a model. And this is right brain. Okay? And what happens as we get, get older, because of various circumstances, at the age of about three to five, this falls to about 97%. So we've got 3% cognition going on over here. They're just starting to put reasoned arguments together and debate with us and go, no, I don't think it's like that. Uh, and they're, they're, they're being themselves. Okay? So we've gone from purity to something we come up over here. When you get to five to seven, that goes down to about 33, um, yeah, about 35 percent. So over here, <laughs> steering me, 65 percent over in this half of the brain. When it goes to seven to nine, it's about 25 percent. So we're now 75 percent in the cognitive mind. Now, when this, these studies were done, this control group of 25 year olds, 25 year olds. How much intuition do you think 25 year olds had left by way of creative ability? You're very close. You're painfully close. Um, two percent. Half it. One percent. They just did absolutely. In other words, they're programmed. And the problem with all this is somebody mentioned it earlier. This is where the ego lives. And that's why everything is divide and rule. Your football team, your religion, your country, your sex, your sexuality as opposed to them over there. They're different. Yes? And that's the problem. We are one human being that comes in loads of different monkey suits, but we all function the same way. My liver's doing what everybody else's liver in the room is doing. And in the world, unless they've got a liver problem, in which case, logically, it's doing one of two things. It's either doing something it shouldn't, or not doing something it should. That's the first movement of disease in any organ of the body. So that means my thought processes must be the same as your thought processes, unless there's something, a kilter, that's not working, we're losing this. Now, I'm going to give you, a, this is a vague figure, it's done by a number of tests, that you can use MRI, uh, you can use those skull cups with loads of electrodes on the head and find out what the brain activity is going on. Cognition 
it's about 500 bits a second somebody's worked it out at, but it can process that. Anyone like to have a guess at what intuition processes are? Multiple. It's about 10,000 times more. It's, 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 we'll, go, we'll go for a figure of 500,000 just to, just to say. So, you know, <laughs> if they're backing us into this half, they're actually making us dumber. Intuition, you all know, are those moments when you get a funny feeling about somebody, but you're not really sure what's going on, but they're not quite kosher and can't work out why. Intuition yeah. should be in a higher, a higher aspect of a, a higher function of the brain that we actually come in naturally with. That's yes. Daniel Rogan. Yes, absolutely. They want us over here in this. Is, is that the same as the left side, right side brain? That's a crude example, but it's a, for the sake of a model, I mean, lots of things happen all over the place. Um, but the, the brain is split, and it, it is meant to be harmonious. It's not quite as, as, as you know, everything that's complicated is on the left side, everything's intuitive on the right side, because these cross over in the brain, these cross over in the yeah. brain. There, there's a lot of duality going on from both halves in terms of motor function. But when it comes to the higher functions of thinking and intuition, crudely speaking, yes, but it also includes the heart. All, all, all higher brain functions then actually quantify the measurable with the technology we've got. Yes. What about those up beyond beyond the higher states that could go beyond the intuition? Uh, I'll, I'll show you how, how it can be. Hold on to that question, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, the, the point being is, uh, the, e the ego is the one that labels itself and defines itself from separate from everybody else. It's said no man is an island, so we, the one thing we have in common is we're all unique. That spins round on itself. The one thing we have in common is we're, so it's, we're, so we're, all, we're physically unique, and uh, you know, creatively, we've all got different talents, <coughs> are you or not? Um, and that's fine, that's how it should be. But as long as this is working, you can grow at a breathtaking rate. Because as this age goes longer and longer, do we talk about old people getting set in their ways? Ooh, learning curve that stopped there. Oh, no, that's rubbish. That is, I've never said this, so it must be true. Uh, let's hear about the ego from people who are authorities better than me, <coughs> long, long way better than me, and see what they have to say about it and see whether you agree. <coughs> Ego is the worst confidence trickster we could ever think, we could ever imagine. Because you don't see it. And the single biggest con is I am you. The problem is that the ego hides in the last place <coughs> you'd ever look within itself. It disguises its thoughts as your thoughts, its feelings as your feelings. It, you, you think it's you. People's need to protect their own egos knows no bounds. They will lie, cheat, steal, kill, do whatever it takes to maintain what we call ego boundaries. People have no clue that they're in prison. They don't know that there is an ego. They don't know the distinction. At first it's difficult for the mind to accept that there's some something beyond itself, that there's something uh, of, of greater value and greater capacity <coughs> concerning truth than itself. In religion, the ego manifests as the devil. And of course, no one realizes how smart the ego is because it created the devil, so you can blame someone else. In creating uh, this imaginary external enemy, we usually, usually made it a real enemy for ourselves, and that becomes a real danger to the ego, but that's also the ego's creation. There is no such thing as an external enemy, no matter what that voice in your head is telling you. All perception of an enemy is a projection of the ego as the enemy. In that sense, you could say that 100% of our external enemies are of our own creation. Your greatest enemy is your own inner perception, is your own ignorance, is your own ego. They're all qualified psychologists, some of them are medics. There's a guy there, um, uh, Hawkins. Uh, now, you asked about mm -hmm. levels of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, had a Kundalini awakening, he was an ended PhD, he had a massive Kundalini awakening when he was 28 and became a spiritual teacher right across the globe. 
if you go onto the internet, I'm choking off thinking about it because it's just brilliant. If you go onto the internet and look at any of his work and just listen to the wisdom that pours out of him, and you sit there and think, yeah, you know when people have got it. Now then, levels of consciousness. He talks about these. Let's just get this out of the way. Okay, let's look at the first log. What this is, is a logarithmic scale. In other words, it goes like that. And it can be tested through the kinesthesiology. You can, you can use re reflexology to actually test uh, what somebody's consciousness level is. This is different from IQ. This has nothing to do with doing maths problems, uh, you know, which shapes are similar and all that. This is a measure of the energetic potential of that individual as, as a conscious being. Enlightenment. These are people, it's, it's, it, this is the commonality. You know, it's, it's all getting quicker. Well, there's a consciousness uh, evolution taking place, and it's a way, but it's rolling itself out across humanity. Some people have got it hundreds and thousands of years ago. Jesus Christ certainly did. Buddha certainly did. Lao Tzu certainly did. Guru Nanak certainly did. And all the spiritual teachers that have ever been have come back to basically say to you, you'll never guess what's running the universe. And they gave it a name, God, Allah, Yahweh, whatever. Um, below 700, you find serene peace at 600. 540, joy, 500, love, 400, reason. Uh, acceptance at 350, that's the non-challenging of things. Willingness at 310, neutrality at 250, and courage at 200. Let me just split a little difference for you. People talk about, you know, you should be fearless. Well, that's all well and good, but some people aren't. The difference between bravery and fearlessness is this, given what they just said about the ego. Bravery has an enemy that feels it is emboldened to be able to vanquish it. Fearlessness has the wisdom to know it's creating the enemy. There is only two human relationships. Who goes there? Friend or enemy? Now, we start to have problems below this. <laughs> because below 200, we have pride, anger, desire, fear, grief, apathy, and guilt. Tell me those are not the ego. Egocentric, negative emotions. Sorry, is there a quick, is there a correlation between that and the actual alpha, beta, beta, beta delta, brainwave states that they function at? Is there a correlation between so they can program it to, to, to dub it down to a certain alpha or beta state. That's what telly's for. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they want. I, I, the honest answer is I don't know. It's an interesting question. I honestly don't know. But I would hazard a guess that somebody has having a higher state of consciousness yeah. would have more of the harmonic resonances yeah. of that as a frequency, mm -hmm. as an energetic creative force. Yeah. Yeah. Um, than those down below. Anyone can feel the dissonance of anger. Yes. You know, when that's coming at you, you know all about it. Mm -hmm. And hence the little Buddhist tone, you know, if I give you a present and you refuse it, to whom does the present belong? <coughs> it's one thing to see anger over there, it's another thing to join in. Yeah, but that's perfectly normal. That's remorse. It's not really guilt. You just, like I do, when I, you know, like any of us, you think I do something stupid, I think, what a, what a complete prat. But I forgive myself immediately and solve the problem I created. I've made the mess, I'll clear it up. It's taking responsibility, which is exactly what you did, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly healthy. That's because you have considerations beyond yourself for others. Unlike the psychopath. Unlike the sociopath. Unlike the narcissist, so you definitely don't want to know. <laughs> but yes, I mean that, that's but guilt I've got remorse. Um, that's just a case of I've been a I've been a complete prat and accepting the fact in that moment you've been a complete prat and getting down and sorting that thing out that we did wrong. And I can make mistakes, I can pop things up every day. But there's no point as I said, there's no point in crying over school. Well you can get yeah, oh, oh I've done it again. Oh why am I such a prat? I'm always a prat. Everybody told me I was a prat. <laughs> Just laugh at it. Know you've done it. It could have happened to anybody. Water got evaporated away. Now, um, 
it said, and I'll try and find it here actually, because it's logarithmic. There's a quote I'm trying to find. Apologies for rumbling through this. I'll read it now because I'm, I'm not going to find it out of shape. It's essentially this. If anyone hits a state of consciousness over 600, <coughs> get ready for this, it compensates for 10 million people who have a consciousness level below 200. Because it's like, if you can think of you're in a field of consciousness, the subconscious isn't unique to each of you. It is. And we all dip into it. It's like the sea we're all walking around in, but we can't see it. In the same way that probably nobody in this room is thinking about the epic magnetic field that's storming out of the floor, going bloody millions of miles and arcing back thanks to the sun. We've forgotten about all that. But in China, obviously, they do this sort of thing and they can feel it. And it charges them up and they can actually feel it doing that. That's how they generate chi. It's electromagnetic. So in that enlightenment thing, it's, it's the equivalent of somebody going off in such a bang that it sends a shockwave out that knocks other people over who are close to that moment. And when I had mine, the funny thing about the accommodation I live in, I got up the next morning and I was serene, I knew everything. There were no questions left, I understood everything perfectly. I was marvelled that it couldn't possibly work any other way. And what I mean is the entire universe. And you just think, oh, it's like a journey that's come to an end. And you go, oh, God. And I heard next door get up, and the, 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 the woman got up, and she said, I've got a blinding headache. And the fellow went, yeah, I'm absolutely killing. It turned out that my neighbor, Kevin, and the woman who lived above him had exactly the same. In other words, that had gone out big time. Uh, there are people in this room who have had similar experiences and your energy field is literally feet away from you, 60 to 70 feet away from you. And if you could imagine an energy that's coming up on the inside, going out, going down to the ground, coming back up through your feet in a, in a sort of toroid sense. It's so powerful. Uh, uh, when, I had, when I was in the state of being over 600, I just had to want people and it wasn't an egocentric desire, it's peculiar, it's an intuitive, intentional desire. Uh, walking through supermarkets and suddenly, you know, with 10 foot ahead of me, people would just part. And I'd stand at the cash register and I could have stood there forever. Absolutely at peace. And then turning around was a queue of people getting the lottery tickets and we all just looking at me. And I could see it, I was, I was golden red for about three to, three to four, three to five months. Epically healthy. All facility return. And everyone I know who's become enlightened has lost all physical pain and all psychological baggage. And it's why Christianity is called the rebirth. You get another go. Throw all this crap away and start again. And in the second half, I'm going to go on to a meditation that I'm going to, if you don't want to join, that's perfectly, perfectly <coughs> cool, that's fine. But I'm going to lead you from one uh, all the way through. How's something on there? Okay. Five minutes, okay. Um, just to explain, let's have a little bit more of this to, to tee you up for the meditation. Think about the mind and energy again. If you take an, an orifice that, that consciousness is pouring <coughs> through, okay, like a fountain, imagine it's a fountain. What we get lost in is its creation up here. We're looking up here at finished models because we're up here and it's completely recalled this horror from our past. What meditation does is it starts to slowly bring you down day after day towards this point where consciousness is coming through. And then there is a state known as no thought. It's an acognitive state where not a single word is passing, not a single model is happening. You have the mind of a child in you. You are purely aware. And what happens because of that is intuition starts to go back up because cognition <laughs> came down. In other words, everything that's been pressurized, you now have the chance to go back over there and reclaim the most vital part of your mind. 
those moments when you have a little problem to solve in your life and you can't think what the hell to do about it and you go off and do something else and then suddenly, of course, what an idiot. And that's because intuition brought the entire solution unworded. Cognition got hold of it and went, yes, because the whole solution that came to you can be rolled out linearly in this world. If I do this first, then this, then this, then this, I'll get it. And when I get those moments, I can, I can, I can feel the cognitive side voting for the intuitive side, and it goes, bang, 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 and I know it steps up. And it's a done deal the moment it's arrived. You must have had moments like that. Everyone's had moments like that. Maybe when you've been struggling with a problem. Have you noticed the more you struggle for a problem, the less it comes? It's like counterintuitive. It's if I tell you a story and I'm talking about a film and I can't remember the name of the actor. You know, he was in so-and-so as well. Ah, oh, what was his name? What was his name? And then what I do if somebody's doing that to me, I'll go, no, I know who you mean. Carry on. They get focused on this story and they're back into the group of wanting to tell me the story because they want to passionately tell me about the film. And about a minute and a half later, it goes, oh yeah, um, and the name comes out. Because they didn't chase after it. It's like the little elusive butterfly of love. The more you go and look for it with your cognitive mind, the less chance it has to come into your intuitive mind. In other words, the more you leave it alone, the faster it comes. So when you get to the moment of enlightenment, what you're in is a state where your eyes are shut, you're bathed in light on the inside completely, loads of other shit happens, <laughs> but you get to that point and it's like, <gasps> and it's in the breath again. How many times have we been somewhere and been so enthralled by something that it's stalled your breathing and you've gone, look at that. <gasps> you freeze yourself in just the suspension of the moment of now in awe of that something. That's intuition. That's a still mind that's been purely intuitive and it's on input big time because your nervous system is an input output system. With minutes left to go, any, everyone happy with the idea that we get lost in the creation of thought? We don't find where it comes from, the source of thought, the natural mind, the mind of a baby sitting there seeing nothing but miracles, rather than some person who's going, oh God, the weather's crap today, isn't it? Well, hang on, if you've got an Eskimo over here, it'd be anyway. <laughs> so which one of them's right? They both get what they want. They both get what they want, because of where they're looking at the it's from. What you see depends where you look at it from, not what you look at. Um, I'm going to call it that. Yeah, I'm going to start mine in the crying sofa.
conscious energy coming through an aperture would get lost in its creation up here. So what do you think happens there? And this is where the epitome of logic comes from. If you can get with that idea that there is a singular mind uniting, the first thing it will do is divide. And things appear to be yang because you're looking from yin. They're tall because I'm looking from short. He's fat because I'm looking from thin. He's old because I'm looking from young. In other words, in the division, we back one course, and what happens is that goes, and we fill it in really quickly. And suddenly they are all these things that I've just come up with. And that's called a train of thought. So we look at something for a long time and we develop a train of thought. But the first stage is we've got to make a decision about it. And the art of this is, is, is sort of hidden in a phrase, I can't remember who said it, it may have been Descartes, it may not have been. Um, judgment without observation is the epitome of ignorance. Observation without judgment is the epitome of wisdom. In other words, you have to let something manifest for long enough while you look at it to then go, got it. Rather than making a upfront pre-judgment because we're thinking too fast, we're going too fast. Religious grace is merely finding the beat of your own drummer. You're not rushing ahead trying to sort everything out, you're not hanging back frightened, he who hesitates is lost, you're in it. You're just there and creation is moving along and it's moving through you. And you can look at that in two ways. We could either say, Everything is changing in the universe and we have a linear timeline that we can measure with the clock. Yeah? Or we could say, well, there is only this moment of now about which there is a rising. Each of those models is equally as valid, but they want you thinking it's linear. What if it wasn't? What? Well, you can get it. well, then you're into scales of proportion. In other words, the universe is a metaphor in itself. What is happening at the microscopic level is what's happening at the macroscopic level and at every stage of appreciation in between. In this sense, so let's have a look at how the human race divides itself in the ego, because it's beautiful. <coughs> it's the self uh, looking at the self with respect to the self. It's the self looking at other with respect to the self. It's the self looking at other with respect to the other, and it's the self looking at other with respect to another other. Now, let me explain what I mean. I could look at, this is, this is me looking in the mirror going, oh, my life's not come to much. I said, oh, be lucky. Um, and I don't have this, my big small, I have a very big car, and oh, I'm tired, I'm just so, you know, lot, and suddenly there's loads of reasons for me not to feel good about myself. But when Jesus Christ said, judge not, lest ye be judged, for it will come back to you a thousandfold, that's the one that hurts. Because anyone here can go, you're a cunt. <laughs> that's a judgment. That's the self looking at another in respect to the self. What the hell are you looking at? The self looking at other with respect to the other is where you go, this is my bum of this. And you want somebody else's opinion about you, not your opinion about them. Can you get the other way around this of that? The self looking at other with another other is why are they doing that to them? Why are the Israelis doing that to the Palestinians? The self is out of the equation. That's not egocentric, these all are. These are, these are about me. Me as a, a conceived entity, the little I, the little eye that thinks it is. This is the big eye that's looking at inhumanity and go, that's got to stop. That is outrageous. That's where morality kicks in. This is where morality kicks in. Where we're, where there's, instead of having a hierarchical world where we're you know, crawling up the ladder and falling down the snake and crawling up the ladder and falling down the snake. No, 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 no. Let's have a level playing field with lots of variety and talent and no one's any more important than anybody else. <coughs> so that's why the self-judging the self is a 10,000 term. Because trust me, I've watched it over the years. People who 
really don't like themselves are constantly beating the crap out of themselves. It's back to what I said earlier. They're doing this. It's like self-abusing psychologically, not physically. Does that make sense? So all these little sayings like, you know, lest you become as little children and then you're in the kingdom of heaven. Well, little children are <coughs> babies. They don't have the wherewithal. They don't have any words to be neurotic with. They can't postulate anything. They're just... But that's the divine perspective. Can you see the difference? That's, that's the only way the human race can divide itself. A fight between two guys outside a pub is a war with only two participants because the same human behaviour is at work in the macroscopic idea of having hundreds of thousands of people doing that on each side. Can you see that? So it doesn't matter what it's called, it's just human behaviour at work again. Which is why two years ago when I came here, as Andy said, the title of my talk was the reason for it all, and it's us. And the other reason for it all is something beyond us, and it's that bit I want you to experience for yourselves in your own lives. Because when you get out, there are no more questions. Nothing. Everything becomes transparently clear. You're either looking at somebody who is a definite enemy to humanity, the psychopath, the sociopath, Tony Blair, you know, <laughs> in the wars, the whole nine yards. Um, the head of Barclays breaking libel, which has affected every single investment on the face of the earth. Your pensions, everything, been crippled by that bastard. How many of them have gone to prison so far? None. No. Who has it said there's one law for the rich and one for the poor? No, there's just one law for the poor. <laughs> That's it. Um, so if you can get with the perspective of how the human race can divide itself up, this is the self at war with the self. This is the self looking at the self. This is the egocentric <coughs> self who's looking at the self in a negative sense. And we all know the people who look at themselves in a positive sense, they're like, yeah, I'm fucking business. <laughs> You're not fit to be in my prison. Uh, all that sort of bullshit. Uh, and that's just the other side of the coin. But they're suffering too because they're lonely. Nobody is reinforcing that egocentric model. So they, they need it. They need that energy. Otherwise, they don't exist, especially a narcissist. They, if, they, if you leave a narcissist alone for too long, they'll disintegrate because there's no one to say, yeah, you are okay, you are beautiful, you are good at this, you are, they want all that energy and they'll do anything to get it out of you. Um, so, just moving back to this for a moment. This is a dangerous activity if it's led to run away with itself, the thinking. If you can get that right, you don't need to go any further. Hello. Uh, in terms of yin and yang, it just talks about thinking. Is that one of the main problems with the political system? In that we tend to think either left wing or right wing, and then we um, uh, put that, um, our idea onto any uh, problem that's in uh, the political problem. Take that a bit deeper. It's the appearance of choice where there is none. <laughs> because when they swap parties, the other one does what the previous one did, but now they say it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. yeah, they are vacuous hypocrites, and they're vacuous hypocrites because they have no morality, yeah. they don't give a shit about anyone except themselves, yeah. yes. they're sitting in the, in this one, the self looking at other with respect to the other, and they couldn't give a shit about this other, because up here they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. They are omnipotent, omniscient. Um, a narcissist who's full-blown considers themselves a, a, you know, the supreme being. But that's not the appreciation of the supreme being, that's them deciding they are it. That's different, that's a decision cognitively, not an experience of the divine, one way or another. Um, 322 so, God. 322 God. You've lost me completely. It's a spiritual verse. They are 322. Stolen bones. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all that, yeah. Well, it's there, so 322. 322 is an actual spiritual verse. Yeah, but they don't have any. Because what do they do at, um, where, where do they meet where, um, once a year? And they, they, they perform the ritual of the sacrifice of care? Yeah. Bohemian Grove. Bohemian Grove, thank you. It's the ritual of, in other words, they don't give a shit. They are sacrificing care. Care doesn't exist. Uh, here's an example of an intellectual narcissist, Richard Dawkins. If you listen to his debates, they're appalling. He's supposed to be a professor of scientific discipline. His arguments are breathtakingly dreadful. And he is an intellectual narcissist. He thinks it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. By the way, his book, The God Delusion, 
There's a guy called Rupert Sheldrake, who is also a biologist of similar magnitude to uh, Dawkins, and he's written a book called Science Illusion, and it's the counterplay to Blue. Uh, and Dawkins hates him, obviously, as a consequence. <laughs> anyone, because it's not anyone who disagrees with Dawkins, well, you're not an intellectual like me. Or you can, you know, can you feel the sort of eccentricity coming up? Um, let me, let's have a look at thinkingness. And I'm going to give you two examples of really good thinkingness. This is grace and finding space between the thoughts. This guy is called um, uh, Stan Rass. Uh, he's a, a, a Franciscan monk, or Benedictine monk, it's Franciscan. Uh, the, the first part of the question is whether the entering into that, through that door of whatever the tradition is, the entering into that room that we all share, that spiritual space that we all share, whether that entering is a matter of thinking or of the heart. And of course the answer is, it is of the heart, but the heart not in the sense in which it is the opposite of thinking, but in the sense that it includes thinking. It's the whole person. So it's, the heart is not excluded, but it's the whole person. And, uh, Another way of saying it, though, uh, because thinking is a dangerous activity, it, it, it tends to run away with us. See, this is the problem. Thinking is fine, but, but thinking has a tendency to run away with us. And so uh, you enter into the real <coughs> heart that includes thinking and feeling and everything else, in the space between your thoughts. Try to find the space between your thoughts. Uh, for most of us, this is very difficult. The kleine, kleine Spalte zwischen den Gedanken, you know? That's very difficult for us to find because our mind is racing. It's always racing. And it doesn't give us a chance to stop in these little spaces. But here, uh, on such, in, with such beautiful surroundings, uh, it's relatively easy to just, for a moment, stop thinking. Uh, if, you, if you can't, if it happens to you spontaneously, that's the best. You stop thinking and you are in the space of the heart, you are in the center. And the thought that then flows out uh, is grace. And that was the second part of the question. Where does grace come in here? Uh, it is. Uh, it is the wisdom that flows through us when we stop thinking. It is, uh, I'm not, I do not, in English it's easier to say than in German. I, I'm uh, not quite sure how to translate that into German. But in English, grace has a double meaning. It's at the one hand, it's guarded, it's geschenkt wird, it's, it's grace that's given to us. On the other hand, it is uh, gracefulness. And gracefulness is what, for instance, a, a horse has when it runs, or a, a dancer has. Uh, and the horse has it always because the horse doesn't think. And the dancer has it only when she stops thinking. <laughs> Uh, when she stops, as long as she thinks, am I doing it well, how it's, how it's going to look, she's not really graceful. When she stops thinking, she's as graceful as a horse or a cheetah or a cat or whatever. Uh, and this is the grace that I'm, that, that is the real grace, that is the cosmic wisdom that flows exactly. In the, under the aspect of the Holy Spirit, of the, of the life method, of aliveness, it's exactly that. And it comes out from inside spontaneously. See, gracefulness is always spontaneous. And it is a gift. See? Grace is a gift. And that's the same word. That's a Christian saying it. Let's hear how a Buddhist puts exactly the same point. This is a great pleasure introducing somebody with their name. Listen to every word. It generally we waste our lives distracted from our two selves in endless activity 
Our lives are lived in intense and anxious struggle, in the swirl of speed and aggression, and our minds cannot stay st still for longer than a few moments without grasping after distraction. We have also overindulged in thinking. Whatever thoughts and emotions arise, we let them sweep us away and off into a spiral of stories and illusions which we take so seriously <coughs> that we end up not only believing, but becoming as well. We are fragmented into so many different aspects that we don't know who the hell we are, or who the heaven we are, <laughs> and what aspect of ourselves we should identify ourselves or believe in. We are always seeking, looking to find ourselves outside of ourselves, as one great master put it. It's like as if you leave the elephant at home and look for its footprints in the forest. So many contradictory voices, the dictates, and feelings fight over control of our inner lives that we find ourselves scattered everywhere in all directions, leaving nobody at home. But regardless of who we are, the main purpose of life, we could call it the heart of being human, is to be happy. It is what we all wish, what we are all seeking, knowingly or unknowingly, for a lasting happiness that free from suffering. He's working up in so much. He's going to that now place. Here, you can see it. Can you? He's going to that place you where you get that. He's overcome. He's overcome at that moment because inside all of you, you have sanctuary. You have a place of great rest and great peace and great wisdom and great knowingness. And as he says, it's not out there. Only the most foolish of mice would choose to hide in the ear of a cat, but only the wisest of cats would think to look there for it. It's not outside. Keep them looking at something, give them iPads, keep giving them adverts, yeah, keep them looking, keep them outside, keep them looking outside, it's all outside, must have this, must have this outside, desire, desire, want, desire. What if you want for nothing? <laughs> what if desire goes? Because people take happiness that they have in this moment and they throw it into the future and I won't be happy until I've got that car, that job, that boyfriend, that girlfriend, anything. So if the happiness is over there, what's over here? Um, because it's not going to be satisfying until I go and get them. And I sat on a train going from some friends and I was serene beyond all imagination. It was just one of those days and I sat smiling. I was bathed, warm inside myself. And there was a group of students going, and they ended up going up to university, and one of them said, uh, in a sort of cursory manner, because they'd been drunk, it was sort of, you know, why are you so happy then? And I just turned to her and I said, because I've realised it's not dependent on anything. It's a state of being. You can't be controlled then by anybody, can you? That's not correct. <coughs> And it's the state of fearlessness, impenetrability. And that's why they don't want us to go and find that. Because when we do, if you'll excuse my French, they won't. Because we've got the bit they can't have. The psychopaths, the sociopaths, the control freaks, the narcissists, the ones that want to run the farmyard, can't do it anymore. You just say, I'm sorry, I'm not participating in this madness. And Nelson Mandela, arguably when he was in a physical prison, was never in a spiritual or intellectual prison because he knew as the impeccable warrior that what he wanted for his people was right. He was never alone. You can never be alone when you have this. You have the love of God. Everyone belongs to you and you belong to everybody else. 
It's the, it's the cure, it's the salvation for all ills. And it sounds wild. But you catch this, and I promise you, and I've watched it happen to other people, gifts come. Gifts come. Because what's happening is we're reversing what's done to us, and we're heading back this way to where the best processing is going on, and it's required, acquired through turning, cognition, and... This is useful, yes, but the problem is it's the wrong way around. This is the master, this is the servant. Unfortunately, they've got us playing that game the other way around. We've lost all of this and all we've got left is that. Be this, be that, be the other, be Mr, be Mrs, be Doctor, be the only fiction. Come into our place of work and we'll hoop the money out of you because we've convinced you that you're that. No, you're not. You're all divine beings that have creation coming through you. But if something gets in the way, or it's used to create a horror inside you, you will rob yourself of facility. You won't become the unbelievably dynamic individuals that you actually are, with the potential that you've actually got. Never mind in terms of a doingness in the outside world, but just to sit still. Be still. And know that I am God. And so are you, and so is everything else. At the moment of enlightenment, something else outside, is consciousness God? Yes and no, there are two other things, light and love that is absolutely everywhere all at once. The universe loves us unconditionally. It's only mankind that hates itself, both between itself and within itself. And you stop that war, and that's why I've got surrender. As the last word on here, relax, breathe, practice, and surrender. Because if you're at war with yourself, they arise together. It's always a truce of a, inside when you're gnawing over yourself. You have to kill both parties for that argument to go. In other words, all you should be doing is leaving that place having used intuition to get cognition to realise what's going on, and then you go back. Because it all makes sense. You don't need the train of thought. You can. I'm using a train of thought to fill things in and sum them up for you as I send this to you from inside me. So, has anybody here ever meditated? Let's have a hands up. Oh, oh, oh it's a huge round of applause to all of you. Not exactly the right idea. Most every day. <laughs> Actually, some people find that the other way around, they become so awake and aware that they can't see. <laughs> it, it depends what suits, it doesn't matter. There's really no right or wrong, but there are some fundamental components. Let me just do a bit of neurology on you. You know you're a nervous system, and if you'd like to contemplate the fight and flight response, that's why they want us in the ego. They, you get the fear going. Um, <clears throat> let's, let's say, let's, let's have a bodybuilder who can flex his muscles at 100%. And down here there's no percent. So this is tension. And this is supreme relaxation. Okay? Now, what most people find is they get to there, about 15%, and they never know this thing exists. Because they've always got <coughs> fight and flight on the go. That's fueled by uh, adrenaline. Noradrenaline, so that's like putting your foot to the floor and the brakes on the car. It's just waiting to do something, but it doesn't know what you're like. <laughs> Noradrenaline. You've also got things like cortisol and other stress hormones. And it's all the uh, hypothalamus, pituitary, uh, thyroid, and your adrenal glands. And it's buggering you up because what's happening then is you've got you've got negative emotions. Negative emotions of the, of the created by the ego um, driving you up this way so you can't relax. Hence they've got us putting them here. You know these mercury lights they want us all to use and they changed it a while ago. The frequency that comes on, they don't want us to have a moment's peace. Because as long as you're buzzed up and you're, you're heading this way and you're heading over into cognition, they've got you where they, where they, where they want you. Uh, you can't actually function properly. Because going that way, you lose all rationality, you lose all logic, you're not batting from the best place inside you. Does that make sense? 
Now, this last bit here, if you can get down to the 0%, this relaxation, let's, let's get it, is physical and psychological. <coughs> And it's psychological because we stop thinking in meditation. Now, what happens when you first meditate? Now, other meditators in the room, I'm going to join in if you feel I'm wrong with this. Um, it's like taming a puppy that you've found in your head that runs around and hoovers stuff up and go and think about this, got to get the milk, I want to get home, I'll this. It's a brain for the future. We have sort of an awareness in our lives in history, a bit of back and a bit of front. And, you know, it's about bringing that to the point where there is no awareness and there is only a and in training that puppy, it's sort of... <laughs> if that's where you should be, what it does is this. It's sort of, you, you, you call it in and then it goes, off oh, now I want to show you this, and then you know, I want to show you this. And you never quite get to that middle place, and then it has all the this. Then you go to sleep and you don't want something. And this is the place where the fountain of consciousness is, but we're getting lost in the arena of the psyche, the holodeck of your own contemplation, to take a Star Trek analogy, you know, we can, the imagination can create anything, and you know that. But it starts by splitting in two, and then you've got the train of thought that colors itself in and fills it all in. So how do we get here? Well, you just, just notice that when you do ask your mind to pay attention to something without thinking about something, it runs off. It goes, no, no, I want to show you this, I want to talk about this. And you think, oh, I'm not, I'm not there. And it's like training a puppy that is, is, it will sit for a while. And the art of meditation is to get to the point where you have got an adult dog standing next to you with its ears erected, its eyes open, and it's just ready. You can't prepare for everything, but you can be ready for anything. And that's why martial arts have machine, which is the martial mind. It's the quiet, still mind that has no fear, because it, as far as they're concerned, they're going for a dance. It's not a fight anymore. You think it's a dance? Yeah, that's what Tai Chi's all about. I'll do this, I'll put him over here, then I'm going to do this. It's a dance. They don't see it as a fight, because they're creating the enemy. The enemy may have it. But the art of martial arts is to defuse the situation without throwing the same punch. That is the impeccable warrior. Or you can, <laughs> and that's why Buddhists do, do Kung Fu, it's why Taoists do uh, Tai Chi, it's why Sikhs have swords, it's why a lot of religious disciplines have some form of martiality in the Eastern Far East. And the reason is because some people are psychopaths, some people are sociopaths, and some people are narcissists, and you're never going to rationalise with them. So because the situation has to come, if you watch them, they always have their left hand over their right. And they do this because what they're saying is intellect before aggression. Let's talk about it first. So they won't do that. Won't do that. It's very subtle. And they're making they're making a conscious decision to be at peace with themselves and everyone of their As a physical feeling. Grounding themselves with the ground. Boom. People stand up. <coughs> no, that's tension. Standing down is the art. So that they can actually drill into the ground and then do shit like this. So it's perfect balance moving from foot to foot because you're moving around your feet. Let's digress and have a play with your own individual puppy. I invite all of you to put your feet flat on the floor and get incredibly comfortable. I'm sure you. No, no, If you don't want to join in, that is also perfectly acceptable. I'm not a dictator. <laughs> now, the, the art of sitting is literally to get physically comfortable as possible. So, I'm going to take you from your eyes open first. I'm just going to make you conscious of your own body. From the feet up to your belly and from the head down to the belly. Because that's where we're going to be stopping in the middle of the belly. Feet flat on the ground. The idea being is you're energetically connected well. Your legs can be slightly open. And it's about flow of energy, flow of blood, be having the body completely at rest, but you're going to be perfectly aware. Come up from your feet, and if you want to just spend some time in your left foot, just feel your left foot in your shoe for a moment. Just be with your left foot and feel the pressure of your shoes. 
texture of your salt, the heat there maybe, and the more you keep the focus of the mind there, the more feedback you get. Yeah? Two minutes ago you couldn't get on monkeys about your feet. Now you're very aware that it might not actually be as comfortable as you thought it was. So be in both of your feet, feel them completely flat on the floor. Come up to your calves, shut them off, you don't need to hold on to your legs. For the upper thighs, spread the weight out underneath your bum across the seat so you've got no pressure points. That might warrant pushing your feet slightly away so you've got an even spread and there's no tight points <coughs> under your bum. That's it, just gently. Just do it gently. But I'm going to invite you to sit right on your crutch and it's going to warrant that you sit forward a bit. But don't um, curve your back. I'm trying to get a perfect poised line in gravity where you can let go of the muscles of your body and just balance in gravity. Now come up to your head and just, most people will get left to right, that looks okay. But forward to back can be a little problem. Find the place where your head is just sitting on your head. You don't have to hold it, it's just all important. So it may not be where it used to be. You might have been looking down a bit. Come down to your shoulders and let your shoulders completely relax. You don't need to hold on to your arms, they're not going to go. Move down into your belly and let all your internal viscera relax in your pelvis. And at this point, for a little bit of amusement, farting and burping is totally acceptable. <laughs> because when you relax tension on the inside of your body, you'll let go of what you've been holding on to. So, the first part of meditation is physical preparation. Get completely comfortable, feet on the floor, turn your legs off and come up to your belly. When you're happy with that, go to your head and come down to your belly. And I want you to imagine an area about an inch below your belly button and an inch in. And be there. And all I want you to notice is the rhythm of you being free, not taking control of it, thinking, oh yes, I'm going to breathe. Just let it happen. And it might be a sort of vague awareness of your belly, but as time goes by, that focus gets tighter and tighter, and you develop a lazy beat. So just sit for a few moments, Noticing your breathing. And if your mind is running around thinking, am I sitting right? Am I doing it right? You're the dancer that's not dancing anymore. You're the dancer that's trying to dance. And if your mind is somewhat noisy, just count to eight on each breath, but count the numbers on the out breath. So it becomes oh. two. And make the camp quieter and deeper in your body each time you go. And now, for the first time in your life, I invite you to let go just be with yourself and the rhythm of yourself being perfectly natural and have a few moments to enjoy yourself. Any noises that pull you away from that place Gently bring the focus of the mind back and notice it flips about it. And the thoughts that want to entertain you. Realize you're thinking about something. Bring it back to that place in your mind. Don't just notice that it happens. It runs around. Or maybe some of you are very good. Because still it Thank you.
brothers found all less to say it was the gaps between your thoughts. Meditation is the art of widening. Do it very gently and very carefully. In your own time, and as gracefully as you wish, draw your mind up from this place, put it back behind your eyeballs, open your eyes. Meditate and what's the best thing to kind of like? I like Elvin Watts' idea in one of his videos. He says it's important for the intellectual life to unthink <coughs> at least twice a day. Ten minutes. Some people find it's easier in the evening and they sleep better. Others find they wake up. It's something to find for yourself at a time of day that you do that suits you. As I say, there's no real hard and fast rule of that. And what about sitting up or lying down? Is it... You can meditate lying, but a lot of people do fall asleep. <laughs> and it's not about falling asleep, it's about being perfectly aware. And you know yourself, um, once, you've, once you've meditated with eyes shut, uh, the next thing is to meditate with eyes open. Let me explain why. Let's go back to the baby or the adult here. <laughs> the adult, <clears throat> you and I know this, you can have a focused mind. It can be solely intent on doing the thing it's doing and it's doing that thing at the exclusion of all other things. If I'm getting this thing built, I'm writing this thing, you're enjoying it. It's totally cool, wonderful. Now, the child has a still mind, but it's unfocused. That's the difference. In other words, it's purely aware that nothing is any more important than anything else. It's like peripheral vision all the time rather than, I'm going to listen to that. And suddenly that's become more important than everything else because my attention is on that. And do you get the idea of that? So, so an adult can have a focused mind doing a job. Yeah, that's no problem at all. The art is having a still mind that is unfocused and is purely aware. Because then, you're on, I this will break yourself off, see? <laughs> you're in receive mode because your nervous system is an anchor system. And, so if you relax all this Qigong and Tai Chi, is about feeling that energy coming in. But you have to be really quiet and really relaxed to do it. That's the bit. Um, <laughs> so th that, that's what we're after here. So as you go through meditation, uh, again, those who've done it, you can maybe if you want to chip in, because I'm probably as good as anybody else, or no, probably more than me. As days go by and you meditate, what happens is what used to be these thoughts that come to get you start to play out at a distance. And it 
it's like there's more of a theatre taking place and you're suddenly not in your mind, you're bearing witness to it out here. And the sounds are out here. And then the question comes is, who's doing the looking? And that's the real you. The mute, still small voice within that never gets a say because there's a cognitive mind rabbiting at such volume everywhere all at once and nowhere at all and we don't hear that still small voice of intuition that brings knowingness without words. And we, everybody in this room, I'm sure knows what I'm saying when I say that we've all had moments of splendid awareness of something quite big that you've condensed down and you've got it in the palm of your hand. You know what's going on. You don't have to tell it this, you don't have to the other. And it's sort of counterintuitive. Anyone who runs after something with their competency mind, you, you're, you're dead before you start. If you stand back and you have a problem to solve, you sort of hold it like a shape in your mind and go, hmm. And then bugger off and do something completely different. And in that doing completely different way, you focus on here doing the something, the universe sort of comes along and goes, um, And those penny dropping moments, the more you meditate, they just come faster and faster and faster. The moment of enlightenment, if it's anything else, let me give you a model for fun, because I like models because they're easier than words. Does everyone remember how films used to be made and you had 24 frames a second and it went past so fast it looked like continual motion? You're watching the film go, that's brilliant, huh? What was between the frames? A line of black and that celluloid strip. Right. When you get to the point of meditating to pure stillness, in some traditions you're called you could be called the stream intro. And what you do is you sort of psychologically slip out of this into the gap between the frames. Only it's pure light, pure love, and pure consciousness. And the thing about immortal and eternal and unchanging is the universe is turning itself on and off at a frame rate that's got a biblical number of laws after it. It's there and it's not, it's there and it's not, it's there and it's not. Every time it comes back, everything's moved. Then it goes away again. And then it comes back again. And you're in the permanence that is the creation of all this. You're in the gap between the frames. And if you want to find a quantum physicist, we could probably have somebody explain that infinitely better than I've just done. Because quantum physics says something can disappear or appear in 17 different places all at once, and then go again and appear in three places all at once. So they, as far as they're concerned, that's, that's a physical reality. They can actually bear witness to that now. And it's turning, oh, off and on. But what people forget about this sign is it's spinning. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Yin and yang and you, uh, some people have seen this before, and, and the yin speaks in two volumes, it's not fine to down there. Uh, ah, there you go. Take a look at that. Now, if conceptually, if conceptually, we can we, we think logically in the cognitive mind, and someone's tall because we're shorter. I mean, if there's three of us here, there might be a short guy here and a tall guy here. So he's seen me as short, and this guy's seen me as tall. It can't be both, right? Can they? So it's perspective. And they're still looking at the one thing, me, but this guy sees me as tall because he's shorter. It's where he's looking from, not where he's looking at. And the tall guy sees me as short, but it can't be both. But the point I want you to look at here Still point that generates all opposites energetically. This sign's moving in Taoism, it's not static. And the reason is because creation didn't stop after seven days, it's still going on. And it starts with that. And they say, first there was the one thing, then there was the two, then there was the three, then there were the 10,000 things. In other words, from their point of view, philosophically, 
creation comes about from a, a, a consciousness that is perfectly at rest and therefore infinitely creative because it's not doing any one thing. Does that make sense? So when you're in a deep state of meditation and you start to get that little smile on your face where it all gets quiet. And I'll give you a little story. Sorry, that's hypnotic. I'll get rid of it because it can sort of drive you. Um, a little story of a guy who went to the garage. I met him once. And he came out to talk to me for some reason. We were talking about something. And he said, uh, oh, I got it when uh, I'd lost my wife to cancer. Um, the kids were killed in a car crash. He'd lost his job and his house. He got nothing left. He had had everything go wrong in his life. He was sitting on the edge of his bed, contemplating suicide, and in his own words, he said, suddenly, it all went quiet. Only that quietness has a quality to it. And he now has a little tattoo on his own chest, which is just an outlining drawing of Jesus Christ. Because he realised at that moment that having become the last, something else made him the first. He lost everything, and in that moment gained everything. But that everything was not material. Immaterial. You are the invisible in the visible. You are the immortal in the mortal. You are in this world, but not of it. You're not actually here. You're operating through this body, but you're somewhere else. <laughs> you're already dead, but don't worry about it. <laughs> the, the, the moment of enlightenment, you appreciate that there is no such thing as death in the sense that you, you can see the egocentric entity comes to an end. It's the fact that the egocentric entity thinks that you're going to come to an end is what causes all fear. Freud was right about one thing. All fear is merely the dilution of the fear of death. So at the interview, that little tremble, you know, will I get a job with the fear? You know, a little, well, a little bit of fear. I want the thing, that's all. The tension. Think of 100% tension in the ears. You know, a little bit of fight and flight. Oh my God. I'm going to die. <gasps> you know, where on the scale are those degrees of fear? And those, that fear comes from a concern for the self. When the self is totally unconcerned for itself, what's there to worry about? Then all there is is everybody else to worry about. And I cry regularly, but never for me. I look at a world of beaten people who are lost in themselves, who are being forced into the darkest places of their psyche by forces outside them that want them to be nowhere, but in their cognitive mind, creating an idea of themselves that doesn't work for them. And I want to tear that prison down for you. And the only way I know to do that, that has worked for me in all sincerity, is the practice of the passion of meditation. Own your mind. The mind should be a playground for the spirit, not a torture chamber for the heart. But it regularly is so many. And if I could throw one switch and send that out across the world, I have no further reason to be here. I'm here to make myself obsolete. And the wave of consciousness that's going across the planet at the minute, I have a really sneaking suspicion that I am rapidly going to become obsolete. And I like that. And I will do everything and anything to make sure that that happens for everybody on this planet. Because I'm looking at walking and wounded everywhere I go. I walk down the street, people's faces are telling me about their lives. You know the one. You know the one. Lost inside us. They're in a world of madness and thinking that they're the one that's got something wrong. Regain your sanity, regain your mind. The hierarchy of the human being that they, the psychopaths and the rest of them want, is a mind that wrecks a heart, that causes disease to the body, and the still small voice has no way of getting itself heard. It should be this spirit. 
heart mind, where this is the master, the heart, and the mind is the servant, then the body is well, and the whole thing is well. The mind causes more disease than anything else. Something like irritable bowel syndrome is, is psychosomatic. If you can break somebody out of that, you cure it without you know, any pills or anything. And um, just to show the absolute severity, <coughs> since the talk was an epidemic of psychiatrists. <laughs> uh, 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 some of you again have seen this before, but it says it really does say it all.
You see, education is obsessed with maths, science. Science is the new religious cult, by the way, they're the new priesthood. Um, I mean, I speak as one, but I like the scientific ethic because I never wanted to skew any data. I wanted to know what was happening in the universe. I wanted to know this work. Um, but that's only a consensus, though, Roger. Well, yes, of course it is. <laughs> it's a consensus that I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a lot of talking heads on. <laughs> because they've lost, we don't have any great scientists in the We don't have any great scientists in the Stephen Hawking that goes around in the wheelchair, you know the guy? Do you know what he's contributed to physics? Nothing. <laughs> we don't know any more than we did, despite all his endeavours. We don't know any more than we did, despite all his endeavours. Dawkins, professor of biology. Does anybody know what he's contributed to science? No, nothing. And in fact, if you read um, uh, Darwin's uh, book on evolution, I think it's chapter 13 of all chapters, somewhere towards the tail end, he actually admits if somebody puts this under intellectual scrutiny, it could all fall apart. <coughs> oh dear. And there's a lot of proof that Darwinism is bullshit. Uh, there's gene transfer within bacteria. Um, between different species of bacteria. Right on, that, that, that's, the, that's the central dog <coughs> of the Darwin's thing blowing off the face of the earth. There are insects that pass on other insects' sperm without realising they're doing it. That validate, it invalidates the central dogma of Darwin. So you should say that um, all these kind of so called insects are giants. <laughs> They've got their doctorates from all these universities. One man is influenced and is perhaps one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, but it's a man George Floyd. Then went to university, self-taught mathematician, developed a Boolean <coughs> algebra, yeah. which is the basis of all information technology, computer science, Absolutely. the internet, CDs, everything, telecommunications, mobile phones, it's all digital electronics. Mm -hmm. He thought of the, the logical framework of it. Yeah. And or not, and or not. That's the one. And, and we, we can go back uh, to a lot of people. I mean, uh, who, who was it that um, uh, came out with Orgon energy? It was Wright, William Wright. He was persecuted, he had his building burnt down. Uh, because all of the that back, we want to put a meter on it. We want to charge you for it. Um, Tesla was another one who died um, in poverty, who, 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 who invented more than almost anybody else because he was a missionary. He also had a Hindu guru. Did anybody know that? He used to travel to London. He had a Hindu guru. So that's how he knew about energy. He knew about chi and kundalini. He knew about this stuff. He knew about this stuff. And it's those people we don't want. Because if you have independent thinkers who are running ahead of the people who've only got cognition, the psychopaths and the sociopaths, they're going to lose. They don't have the intellectual facility you've all got in the room if you cultivate it with meditation. So down cognition, intuition goes back up. And it's a case of bringing that balance down to the master and slave thing, where your intuition is the master and your cognition is the servant of that master, not the other way around. Then you get a chance to deconstruct your egocentric prison. So when you're meditating, you'll often get things that do come back to haunt you in a way. And they're there for a reason, externalize them, write them down. And you'll suddenly think, it's not an awful lot. And then play the perspective game. Why do I keep looking at that like that? I'll try and find some good in it. And the more you play that game, Thought has momentum, it will start spinning around the right way. And you, can, you can't stop looking at things and going, yeah, of course. Why do, and suddenly you feel such a prat that you held all these convictions about yourself and other people and things. Mm. That's stasis, that's not growing, that's sticking with ideas that you're going to defend to the counter. That's not being <coughs> open minded and taking on new ideas and building new models. The whole universe is growing. We grow physically to a certain point, then we get old and wrinkly and grey, but we're growing on the inside all the time if you give yourself the opportunity. And that's all I really wanted to say. Dude, I would roller skate in here now if I had any sort of cooper. fantastic synopsis of what Roger's really been teaching us, or a few of us, for two years now. And as I said, we've all become friends and a community. And so thank you very much for coming tonight. Come to